Richard, Duke of Gloucester, isn't exactly the Renaissance ideal of handsome. His permanent limp, withered arm and hunched back make dogs bark as he passes by. We might feel sorry for him if he wasn't such a devil. That's right, Richard is right up there with Shakespeare's most epic villains. Now that Richard's eldest brother, Edward, is the King of England, there's a party atmosphere in the palace. The House of York have defeated their rivals, the Lancasters, so the Yorkists are celebrating. But parties aren't Richard's thing. He prefers to plot his own path to the throne. He's already turned King Edward against their middle brother, Clarence. Poor Clarence now awaits his fate in the dreaded Tower of London. Of course, no one suspects that Richard is behind this. Only the audience get to know Richard's deep, dark thoughts. When Richard finds out that Edward is seriously ill, he starts plotting Clarence's death. If Edward dies first, Clarence will be freed from the tower and given a real shot at the English throne. Richard can't allow that to happen. In the meantime, Richard successfully woos Lady Anne. This is quite impressive, considering she genuinely hated Richard for killing her husband and father-in-law. Let's be clear, though, this isn't a love match. Richard will marry Lady Anne, but he won't keep her for long. She's just another pawn in Richard's strategy for the crown. But there are women in the palace who are on to Richard. For one, Queen Elizabeth sees Richard's lust for power and is wary of him around her two sons, the princes. If King Edward dies, she knows that Richard will hover over the princes and the throne like a bad smell. Then we have old Queen Margaret, King Henry's widow. She's still hanging around after losing everything to the House of York, including her husband, son and status. She curses Richard for murdering her family and everyone else for their part in the downfall of the Lancasters. King Edward tries to ease the tension in the palace by summoning everyone to mend their grudges. But Richard's got other plans. He meets with two assassins and sends them to kill Clarence in the tower. Clarence is stabbed and drowned in a barrel of wine. Yikes! That's a bad way to go. When Richard finally joins the royal reconciliation session, he sets the cat among the pigeons. Clarence is dead. Richard blames King Edward's previous execution order, which Edward had tried to reverse. After Edward is carried back to his sickbed with shock, Richard also lays the blame on Queen Elizabeth's relatives. This stirs up the old grudges between Elizabeth's family and the king's loyal nobles. Meanwhile, the Duchess of York breaks the bad news to Clarence's children. Their father is dead. The Duchess of York is the mother of King Edward, Clarence and Richard. She warns her grandchildren about their uncle Richard. She knows he's a monster. When Queen Elizabeth enters with red eyes and crazy hair, there's more bad news. King Edward has died. The Queen's brother, Rivers, advises her to have her son, the young Prince of Wales, crowned as soon as possible. Then, as if on cue, Richard shows up with his cronies. He and his minion, the Duke of Buckingham, will be part of a small group who'll escort the Prince to London for his coronation. Of course, their secret plan is to separate the Prince from the group and stop him from being crowned. News of the King's death makes people nervous. On the streets of London, some cluey commoners discuss England's future. If they're about to be ruled by a child, they know trouble is coming. Rivalries in the royal household will complicate the transition of power, especially since Richard is full of danger. Fast forward a few days, 
and Queen Elizabeth and the Duchess of York eagerly await the Prince's arrival in London. But bad news arrives instead. Queen Elizabeth's brother and son by her previous marriage have been imprisoned in Pomfret Castle. This place is notorious for its gruesome executions, so Queen Elizabeth fears the worst. Sensing the danger, Elizabeth takes her youngest son, the Duke of York, to sanctuary in Westminster Abbey. The Archbishop of York offers to protect Queen Elizabeth and appoint her as England's next monarch. Good luck with that. The Archbishop is no match for Richard and his powerful friends. When the young prince arrives in London, the Duke of Buckingham orders for the little Duke of York to be yanked out of Westminster Abbey. So much for sanctuary. When the Duke of York is brought in, Richard bundles both boys off for a holiday in the Tower of London. Thanks, Uncle Richard. Now that the little princes are out of the way, Richard and his cronies can work on making Richard king. If you're wondering why anyone would want to help a toad like Richard, the answer is simple. Bribes. Richard has made all sorts of promises, including land and titles, to his helpers. Whether he'll keep those promises is another question. When Lord Catesby tries to lure Lord Hastings to the dark side, Hastings refuses. He was loyal to Edward, which means he's loyal to Edward's sons. Hastings would rather have his head chopped off than help Richard be king. Doesn't Hastings realise how dangerous Richard is? Queen Elizabeth's relatives certainly do. Over in Pomfret Castle, Lord Rivers, Lord Grey and their friend, Sir Thomas Vaughan, are about to be executed. Why? Because Richard wants to cut off Queen Elizabeth's support network. As they walk to their deaths, Grey and Rivers realise that old Queen Margaret's curses are coming true. Rest in peace, fellas. When Richard finds out that Lord Hastings refused to take part in his plot, he makes up an elaborate excuse to have Hastings executed. Poor Hastings. His loyalty to Edward made him lose his head. With all these high-level executions, Richard needs to convince the public that he's the good guy. Richard and Buckingham start by convincing the Lord Mayor of London that Hastings' execution was fair. The Lord Mayor might be a pushover, but are the people. When the local Scrivener reads over Hastings' execution order, he can tell it's a fraud. If his opinion is anything to go by, London's commoners will also be sceptical. When Buckingham returns from an attempted public pep rally for Richard, he reports that the masses were frosty. They need a different strategy. So, under Buckingham's instructions, Richard appears to the public like a shy, innocent monk. Standing between two priests and carrying a prayer book in each hand, Richard pretends to reject the top job. Eventually, Richard accepts the crown as if it's a great burden on him. What a performance! And the citizens buy it. Richard's coronation is scheduled for the following day. But what about the princes in the tower? When members of the royal household try to visit the little princes, the constable prevents them. Uh-oh, that can't be good. When Lord Stanley informs them that Richard is about to be crowned, Queen Elizabeth begs her other son, Dorset, to flee to France. Lord Stanley backs her up. Dorset must go to France and find Stanley's stepson, the exiled Earl of Richmond. He'll give Dorset a warm welcome. Back at the palace, Richard has now been crowned Richard III. Now that he's got what he wanted, Richard asks Buckingham for another favour. Kill the princes in the tower. That's cold. When Buckingham asks for time to think on it, Richard hires an assassin to do the job instead. 
He also arranges for Clarence's children to be demoted into social obscurity. His next plan is to marry his other niece, Elizabeth of York. She's the daughter of King Edward and Queen Elizabeth, so marrying her would secure his position. But that's so gross. Will she marry her murderous, nasty old uncle? When Buckingham returns, Richard brushes him off. He's more concerned about the situation developing in France. Dorset has fled England to meet the exiled Earl of Richmond. Should Richard be worried? Buckingham now realises that Richard's promises were false. He'd helped that hunchbacked toad become king for nothing. You'd better flee back to Wales, bucko, before you lose your head. A short time later, Tyrrell the assassin reports to Richard that the job is done. The princes in the tower are dead and buried. Richard is pleased and, when he's alone, gloats about all his dirty deeds. He's also got another fresh body to add to the pile, his wife, Lady Anne. Now that she's out of the way, he can aggressively pursue his niece, Elizabeth of York. But that will have to wait because Buckingham is marching his Welsh army towards London. Meanwhile, old Queen Margaret is enjoying the chaos. Her revenge against the House of York is almost complete. She just wants to witness one more death, King Richard's. In fact, that's what Queen Elizabeth and the Duchess of York also want to see. When Richard enters, preparing for war, his own mother, the Duchess of York, curses him to die violently on the battlefield. Ouch! But it's water off a duck's back for Richard. He's more focused on wooing his niece. Naturally, the idea is offensive to Queen Elizabeth, but she agrees to speak with her daughter about Richard's proposal. But Richard can't marry anyone yet. He's got a war to win. Richmond has landed on England's west coast and is busy making alliances. He's coming for Richard's crown. This puts Lord Stanley in an awkward position. He's Richmond's stepfather, but he must appear loyal to King Richard. Why? Because Richard will execute Stanley's son, George, if Stanley doesn't cooperate. But Stanley passes on a message to Richmond. Queen Elizabeth has offered him her daughter's hand in marriage. This would secure Richmond's claim to England's throne. Well played, Liz. Richard has a small win when the Duke of Buckingham is captured. As he is led to his death, Buckingham calls on the souls of Richard's victims to witness his execution. It's All Souls Day and those restless spirits are listening. Meanwhile, Richmond and his growing army have marched to the middle of England without opposition. It appears that Richard is losing allies to Richmond. Even so, Richard remains confident and sets up camp in nearby Bosworth Field. But as night draws in, Richard grows more anxious. That night, both Richard and Richmond are visited by the ghosts of Richard's victims. They curse Richard to despair and die and bless Richmond to live and flourish. The next morning, Richard wakes in terror while Richmond rises with a spring in his step. Encouraged by the ghostly visitors, Richmond gives his troops an uplifting pre-battle pep talk. It's quite different to Richard's battle speech, which is hateful and bloody. At the last minute, Richard receives word that Lord Stanley has defected to Richmond's side. Has Stanley just sacrificed his son, George? In the heat of battle, Richard's horse is killed, so he fights on foot. He eagerly seeks out Richmond, although he'd give his kingdom for a horse. Then, the moment we've all waited for, Richard and Richmond meet for an epic medieval showdown. Swords clash, trumpets blast and drums beat as they fight for the crown. 
and Richard is slain. It's victory for Richmond. Richmond graciously accepts the crown and looks forward to a peaceful reign with Elizabeth of York by his side. Oh, and good news, Lord Stanley's son is alive. Hooray! This marks the end of the decades-long Wars of the Roses and the beginning of the House of Tudor. Whether England enjoys real peace from this point is up for debate. But what's history without drama? Richard III may have been a shocking tyrant, but he gave Shakespeare some great material. We hope you enjoyed this Schooling Online production. For more easy lessons, check out our other videos.